depends on using dimensional modeling in a modern data stack. So as you can see, it's about being change aware when you are doing your data modeling. Yeah, so uh, about, about me, um, I am currently I currently serve as a senior data engineer at Graph. Uh, so I am a tech speaker and an occasional writer on data engineering topics. So you may have seen me around on some of the blog posts or in your Pi Data talks. And I am ninety percent self taught because as you can see, where the ten percent actually came from, it comes from my engineering degree. So my engineering degree actually comes in very useful. So before we begin, some disclaimers here. So everything in this talk is based on my own technical expertise. There's nothing to do with my team or my employer. So it's pretty much like my personal experience based on hard-won battles. And the scope is primarily focused on structured template data. So I understand that for data versioning, that we have structured and unstructured data. So it's a similar concept, but the focus of this talk is on your structured template data. So let's imagine this scenario in your data team. So imagine that finance department requests a regen of your report dated 11 months ago for client A because it's your regen, right? So we need to regenerate the report. Okay, so client A has already been upgraded from what tier two customer to tier one customer three months ago. So if you, if you are somehow promoted in your tier that you increase your earn rate. But the problem is that you do need to regenerate the report based on the tier two and earn rate because, because client A was tier two. So you can't really generate it based on the fact that he's a tier one customer because he wasn't. So this is what the data will look like in this scenario. So when you are doing, so at some point in time, it was, so you can see that client A was a tier two customer. But, but then like, you know, when you're trying to regenerate a report by the end of the year, it's already a tier one customer. So what happens if we regenerate the rebate report for like, for like 11 months ago at the end of the year? And now, you're, now that your customer tier actually has been updated and overwritten. So what do you do in this instance? Okay, because you can't find the data back, right? So this brings me to the concept of time in dimensional data model. So time is an important dimension in your data because the data is usually not static because you can have state transitions during a business process and your attributes can also change over time, such as your age, your income, your status, and in the, in the in previous case, even your customer tier can change. So, so, so don't assume that your data is static. And, and, why, and this brings us to the importance of data versioning. So what is data versioning? So data versioning is the concept of capturing state changes while keeping track of successive versions of the data over time. So what it means is that, in, that for each data record that you create, you need to create a unique reference for those collection of data when those changes occur while we will retain the previous versions. So, there are, so there are two general data versioning approaches. So one is more for your structured data, which is what, we, what is known as change data capture. So there's also an extension of, data version, of this change data capture approach, which is applied to unstructured data, which is the concept of data version control for your unstructured data. So, so, so for those who are not very familiar with data versioning, so this is what your change data capture and your data version control roughly looks like. So change data capture is what we are quite familiar with, you know, the traditional approach of having our timestamps and, and, and having your valid from valid too. And for data version control is more on, like, you know, like something like version control for data. So you have examples like your, like, you know, like the iceberg or you have your DVC and so on and so forth. So those are actually like extension of change data capture. So why does data versioning matter? So, as we can see, the re one of the main reasons why it matters so much is because of reproducibility for data governance and audit purposes. Because let's say at the end of the year, we need to regenerate those reports, and we also need, and we do need to be able to capture all those changes of your dimension, of your dimensions over time. Because, because we, do, because we do need to be able to, like, you know, report to the, or whatever authority it is, like meet your data governance team or meet your audit team. 
and you need to have an audit trail of like the changes on your know, data. Then number two is you need to build, so is to build data history with backward and forward compatibility. So that is more for the data team. Because what if there is a change in transformation logic that only applies to a specific time range? But let's say, let's say they say, that like marketing says, we have a promotion for a specific time period. So we will need to change our competition logic for our rewards. So in this case, it's only for that specific time range. And you need to be able to capture this type of change in logic. And last but not least, this is a little bit similar to the first point, but it's more of the fact that when you need to use point in time values to track business metrics over time. So this is more for your, it's more in the case whereby if as the business user, they need to be able to have a good profiling of how, let's say the customer profile actually changes over time. So they do need to have a, so they do need to have a good audit of that to be able to monitor their, monitor their business metrics. Okay, so now we've talked a bit about data versioning. Now what is change data capture? The change data capture is simply data versioning from databases. So those are design patterns for capturing and tracking changes in your data from your upstream source systems over time. And, and, and in this case, our changes are actually captured in either your data warehouses or data lakes. I mean, the differences are not very clear anymore because your data lakes are having to, are going to have your data lakes and your data warehouses are, no, they are data warehouses. Okay, so some design patterns for change data capture are firstly the data versioning based on a combination of, you know, type the version identifiers, timestamps and status indicators, whether, which means that whether, the, whether the record is valid or not. Uh, another another data pattern that's very common is your log trigger or tuple versioning, which is also known as type two slowly changing dimensions, which I will elaborate a bit on later. And last but not least, is transaction logs. So transaction logs are specific to the system. So let's not talk about that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So now I've talked about why do the data versioning matter, why is change data capture. So now let's go on to the let's go on to the context of this talk. So what do we mean by the modern data stack? So it's not so it's so it sounds like a fancy word, but simply put, modern data stack means that it is cloud-based, built around the cloud data warehouse of the data lake, and it's modular and customizable. So instead of the traditional approach whereby we choose a vendor and it's a fun size mid off, we choose the best tool for the best job. So if we look at the components of a modern data stack. You have your ingestion step, which is the, which is done by the data loader. You have your data, which loads data from certain upstream source systems to your data warehouse, and th and then after, and then we go through data transformation, which goes through, like let, let's say we have the staging layer, we know the bronze, silver, gold. So we, this is also what we know as we call the medallion architecture, and after we process it into the gold layer. This is subsequently used by downstream users, which could be for your machine learning, or it could be for data, data visualization. And those are orchestrated by Airflow, like let's say like a workflow orchestration tool such as Airflow. So, um, it, so what about data warehousing in the modern data stack? So because, of, because we are using cloud-based compute and storage, this means that your compute and storage are now more scalable compared with your traditional data warehouses. And instead of the traditional ETL approach, we are now moving more towards an ELT approach, whereby the transformation is done within the data warehouse. And last but not least, the most important implication of, the, of this more scalable compute and storage is that it is now possible for us to store snapshots of data in a cloud data warehouse to capture all those historical changes. So this is something that cannot, may not be able to be done in the traditional data warehouse whereby compute and storage is a, it's a, it's a blocker. And now we talk about what's the difference between the modern data stack and your traditional data warehousing approach. We go to the point about the change data capture in the modern data stack. So now we have this modern data stack. So what are the implementations that we have for change data capture? So we have the traditional Kimball's dimensional modeling techniques, which is mainly on the concept of slowly changing dimensions. And we now also have 
of modern approaches such as using data snapshots and also leveraging on incremental models. Those are a little bit more modern and a bit more functional. Let's go on to this. Let's go on to all these techniques. So the traditional Kimball style dimensional data modeling. So for historical context, it's developed by Kimball in 1996, and it was quite updated with the latest update being in 2013. During the emergence of cloud data warehouses, that's where you have your BigQuery and your Redshift. And, and this is an important concept because, because Kimball introduced the concept of facts versus dimensions. And, 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 in the, and during the time when you have limited compute and limited storage, this data modeling approach is designed for storage and compute efficiency. And so, so let's go into the fundamental concept of facts versus dimensions. So fact tables are, okay, so what fact tables? Fact tables contain metrics and facts about business process. So it could be something about your process time or the transaction amount during the business process. And one of the defining characteristics of a fact table is that they are typically fast evolving during a business process event. But eventually, it will reach a final state at a point in time upon completion. So, in the, so you know when it will end, when, the, when this process will end. So there is a definite end point. Dimension tables, however, they describe the attributes of a business process. So it could be your customer details. And they are typically slow changing and updated over a longer period of time because you don't, so okay, maybe you know that like your customer is going to be like age 30, like age 30, like this year at age 31 next year, but you don't know whether your customer is going to upgrade to tier two to tier one or is going to get married or get divorced. So you don't, you can't really estimate when the data dimension will change. And they typically do not have a final state per se compared with a fact table. And this brings us to the problem of slowly changing dimensions. How do we capture changes that are slow, that are, they are slow and unpredictable? Yeah, so, okay. So we talk now. Now we, now we bring. Now we talk about slowly changing dimensions. Let's talk about the types of slowly changing dimensions. Okay. So what is slowly changing dimensions? So slowly changing dimensions are change tracking technique to handle the state changes in dimensions. So you have the type zero, type one, type two, type three, type four, type six, uh, many, many types. But let's just go through the important types. Right, so type zero, it's very simple. It's fixed dimension. So something like account opening date. So once you create it, you're not gonna change it. So it ignores any changes. If you try to change it, it's not gonna change. Because it assumes that this attribute will not change forever. Okay, type one, on the other hand, reflects the latest version of dimension attributes. And what happens is that when you when you have a new record, and then you and then you realize that this new record is actually related to the to uh, to something that's existing, so the previous version of that value is overwritten with a new value. So great, we have updated the changes, but in this case, you have destroyed history because what if it is an erroneous update? It's not possible for you to rewind back to the previous version of the data, so that's lost. Okay, type two, which is a very, which is the focus of this talk, is implements role versioning for each dimension attribute. So for so for each record, you have a concept. For each version of data, you have a concept of validity period. So you have a role effective date, you have a role exclusion date, and sometimes you may even have a current role indicator. So in, so well, in this case, when the change is detected in a data record, instead of immediately overriding the record, you create a new dimension role with the updated attribute values for the data record. And, and, with the, and for that particular new dimension role, you create a new primary surrogate key and then the previous version of the attribute is updated with the row expression timestamp. So instead of overwriting, his, destroying history, you are updating history. So what? Okay. So 
just just now I mentioned about turbo versioning. So what is turbo versioning? So on so turbo versioning is a HR capture mechanism that record changes to a mutable upstream table over time and implements your type 2 SCDs on a mutable table sources. And typically it will detect change based on some updated at timestamp, but maybe your naming may change, but the rough idea is there. So some components is that you need to know where are you going to save your tuple versioning. You need to know where to track. You need to know what's the unique identifier, and you need to know whether to invalidate records no longer in source. But sometimes you may delete the record. So, so, so this is an illustration of how tuple versioning works. So we have some timestamp that we are tracking, and we are using that to determine the validity period of the record. So this is the initial state. And then when you see that there is an update in the customer tier from tier two to tier one at a particular point in time, instead of overwriting it, you capture the changes in, in this case. So now you can see that we, in, we have an updated the validity period for the previous record. Okay, so we have the type three, type four, and so on and so forth, but we're not going to go that in depth into that because this is less commonly used and it's a bit more complex. So let's not. So you can read it on your own. Right, now let's go into the more modern topics. So data snapshots. So data snapshots are read only immutable copies of the state of the data source at a particular point in time. And Usually, you will store all those data snapshots at the staging area of data warehouse, whereby you ingest from the source, and then you and then you, you throw it at the staging area for further processing. So you can think of it as you're taking timestamp images of the data sources. So you're like taking photos of it at a, at a certain period of time, and instead of directly take, directly creating your SCD tool, you are creating your data snapshots and so that you have those data snapshots and then you can proceed to create your SCD tools or whatever data, downstream data models that you like to create. Because, what, because in case you, you mess up your SCDs, at least you still have those data snapshots to fall back on. Okay, now um, to, 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 to complete this discussion, we have incremental models because we need to capture changes in your upstream data into your downstream models. So the concept of incremental models is that you limit the data transformation to a specified subset of source data. So typically you want to be able to capture those data that have been cre newly created or updated since the last schedule run. Because you don't want to do extra work, right? And in this case, not only do you not do extra work, you also significantly optimize your runtime on your transformation of the large data so that's a, so that's how, that's why you may want to use in the incremental approach instead of a full full load, full load, full load approach. Now something like this. So it takes a bit of work, but you need to determine like, what is the incremental load that you would like to load. Because you want and it's typically what has changed since you previously ran your last scheduled job. You need to get the delta. And how it really, how it actually looks like in let's say your DBT models are uh, you will typically define where do you insert the load, how do you insert the load, where do you get the load, and you no know, before you think about where do you get the load and all those things you need to know like what do you, like what do you do, what is the condition for this incremental load because otherwise you're going to load the whole thing. So this so those are the thinking approaches that you need to think of when you are def defining an incremental model. So if we are looking at an SCD2, it's pretty straightforward because if you're doing just an incremental load, you just need to select the most current records and just load it in. Yeah, so you can see it's just some like, you know, like if you see that you can just look at what is the most current record and your job is done. Yeah, okay, so um, so some things to think, think about when you are talking about think, designing an incremental model is, does it already exist? Because if it doesn't exist, then you have to do the full load. Do you want to just, did, like, is there something wrong with your transformation and you want to refresh the whole thing? Or things are fine, so let's do an incremental run. So you need to include those cases. And then what's the incremental strategy? So it depends on whether it's a data warehouse or the data lake. And then some columns to track changes. So those are the typical. Yeah. Okay. So uh, 
is okay, so is Kimba's approach still relevant? Especially in the modern era stack. So this so turns out it still applies because even though your storage and compute are dirt cheap, it you know this this doesn't really apply for very large dimensions because your storage and compute are not going to be very cheap in that case. And this does not preclude the importance of dimensional data modeling. So if you kind of find out more, you can read his blog. We can read the uh, message between his blog posts and, and and also watch his talks about that. Yeah, and in some way, and it doesn't mean that we need to capture to learn everything about Kimball because yes, in some ways you do need and and typically you will really need to do a dimensional data modeling in certain cases. So. One case is when you need to aggregate facts, then yes, you do need to put in some work into how to model your data. Secondly, it's about metrics drill down based on dimensions. So you also require some thing, some thought in how do you want to model your data. And last but not least, you typically Kimball is still used in financial reporting and audit because this is where it comes to very useful. You need to have a you need to have an audit of your data changes in data over time. So that is a requirement. So in this case, you can't say I don't want. You can't say I don't want to do Kimball. You have to do Kimball in this case. Okay, so now to round up this talk, I'll share some tips and tricks on on ensuring that your data modeling is change aware. So, yeah. So first tip is to snapshot all your upstream source data. Yeah, because you are now in the modern data stack. Your compute and storage are scalable. And what if assumptions of our data change? So let's say your drag and team tells you that it's an append only, but it's an override. So what do you do? If you do, if you generally use an SCD tool, I'm not sure how you're going to rewind your changes. You know. So still, please save your upstream source data and snapshot them. And secondly, you know, like you have all those things like, oh, um, my columns are changed, my columns are dropped, I add some columns. So you still need to be able to have a photo of your state of your upstream source. And last but not least, it's about your business logic. Because they can tell you that retroactively, hey, we need to apply some business logic retroactively. So you still need to have those copies of your snapshot to be able to modify your logic. And as I mentioned previously, store your data snapshot in a staging area and build SCDs from there instead of having your SCDs directly Directly reading from your from your upstream source. So in this way, if you mess up your SCDs, you still have your data snapshots to rely on. Yeah, and of course, talking speaking about like about schema changes, uh, it's useful to detect your schema diffs to your upstream source and your data warehouse. So something like this, will, something like a source target schema reconciliation will be useful for you to detect changes. And use type two SCDs and incremental models and because. Yeah, type two SCDs are typically sufficient for tracking and capturing data changes. You don't need to go into SCD three or four in unless in special cases. And you may think that well, why do I need to think about incremental models? It's so complex. But when your data is going to 10, 10 times, twenty times, one hundred times, having a thinking of it in an incremental way it will pay off in terms of efficiency and cost. So. Unless you are like a startup and you are, when you want to deliver fast, then you can go ahead with the, you know iterating fast. But if you want to think of it, think of your data, in data models in a more long term manner, then it pays off to actually develop in an incremental way. Uh, and some and to then to round out the talk, some strategies on designing your incremental models will be to design with your upstream data mechanism, data update mechanism in mind. And also think about your incremental strategy because it depends on what whether you are using a data warehouse or a data lake. And a performance tip is that you want to filter those early before you do any computation, because if you do the computation first and then filter it, then it's going to be pretty expensive. And so some key takeaways would be yeah to adopt a mixture of like SCD approach, SCD like approaches and incremental models, and also data snapshots. So that, that's that's about it. So thank you. And you can get those slides with this QR code. Thank you.